Welcome to day 21 of your 30-day dental MBA, having fun with oral surgery and implantology. I know a lot of people were very excited about this tape because they thought the implants were actually breast implants. I'm sorry to tell you, I should have said dental implantology. We've had a lot of returns on this tape. But uh, basically, before we get started, I had to pay homage where homage due. I mean, um, the only reason I found Carl Misch, is, as we were talking earlier, is that you know, you go to dental school and the law doesn't say, oh, you go to dental school and self-direct study for four years and just go in there and, you know, sit in the library and read whatever and come out four years, you do your time uh, and you get a dental degree. You go into dental school or law school or med school or college or anywhere and they have a structure. And the elders are trying to pass down information to the next generation and they have put structure into it. Well, you know, I figured if 12,500 people graduated from Panky Institute, there's got to be some knowledge on there somewhere and obviously there was tons of it. I figured if 12,500 dentists had their fellowship in the AGD, there had to be some reason for that. Uh, if, if 1,250 dentists had their master in the Academy of General Dentistry, there had to be some structure in that. So I signed out, I was gonna do my FAGD, and at first it wasn't a rush, because you had to be a dentist for five years, and um, you had to have 500 hours of community ed. And then about years three, I realized I had about 500 hours, and they were all in just a couple subjects there. You know, fillings, and restorative dentistry, and clinical dentistry. And I started realizing that I was going to have to take, you know, like all these hours, these certain categories that I didn't want to take. And that's the genius of this effigy. They forced me to take ortho and implants, these things that I didn't want to do. But the 60-year-olds knew why I needed to do it, but I didn't know at the time. That's why you need to force yourself to do this. But anyway, so I took all these courses because the FAGD was just lecture. Then you wait your five years and take an exam. No big deal. Got that. But then I thought, okay, well, I mean, I'll go on and get the FAGD. The problem with the FAG is 600 more hours, but 400 hours was hands-on participation. Well, where do you find hands-on participation when you live in Arizona, which doesn't have a dental school, which all the lectures in the back of the hall in course don't count? So I had to search around the country to get participation courses, and I decided the only reason I signed up the mission is because everywhere I went, everybody said this guy uh, walks in water. Um, um, the only guy that might be in this guy's league is Dr. Brandmark, and he's considered the father of implantology. But anybody knows, all you got to do is review the literature. And for every time you see Dr. Brandmark, see Carl Misch's name about 49,000 times, even in his own country. I mean, Misch is absolutely obsessed with implants. All he's ever done. Uh, he's a dentist. Um, and then he went on to be a prosthodontist. And he went on to sink about 30,000 implants. He's done more implants and probably <laughs> more animals, monkeys, you name it, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. He's got practices in Europe, South America, Argentina, a couple of two or three offices in America. It's unbelievable. So I said, when I looked at this mission too, I heard everything about him. So I said, okay, five three-day weekends, 2,000 bucks a weekend. Okay, I'll go down there and do it. Oh my God, little did I know that even though I had fulfilled all my implant requirements for a fellowship in the AGD, that after, after I had taken probably 30 one or two-day lectures, and implants, I still hadn't even been introduced until I went down to the Mish Implant Institute. I would have had no idea that uh, within two or three months, hell, I'd want to do a sinus lift, that I'd be back again and again and again. I mean, it just it was it was almost like uh, an addiction. Um, call up Carl Mish. His phone number is 1-888-MISH-99, 888-M-I-S-C-H-99. Um, his website, www mish.com www.misch.com I think that's a capital M on the mish um, I don't know if that matters or not on the internet anymore if it's, it's one said it's not case sensitive one said it is but anyway to implants this is a whole new world your only limits are what you know for certain a lot of dentists tell me well I don't want to go to the mission suit because you know I don't want to place them I just want to restore them that's equivalent to saying I just want to make decisions based on half the information. I mean, that's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, when you're treating plant, if you've never placed an implant, if you never, I mean, just, I don't care if you, if you say you never want to place implants, fine. But first, climb the mountain, slay the dragons, and place 10. You can place 10 with Carl and held in your hand or whatever, but how do you treat my plan when you don't place them? Like you see these cockamamie treatment plans by dentists who keep saying, I just want to restore implants. And they don't realize that, with the take of the bone. You take, you, when people talk about, when, when they would do advertising about implant success rate, they're always talking about implants from the mental frame and forward on the mandible. Why? Because the, the maxillary jaw is the floor of the skull. 
okay, the lower jaw is hooked on to the head in front of the ear. You should know that by now, you are a dentist. Well, maximum force and flexure comes down here. This bone is like oak wood. Any implant, hell, I bet if you went, I bet if you went to Ace's Place Hardware and bought a gosh darn non-titanium screw and just screwed it down right here in the middle of the it'd probably work. I mean, I don't think, it's pretty hard to get a failure here unless you burn bone, whatever. By the time you get to the back, the wood's starting to get softer, you know, then maybe this is uh, cherry, maybe this is oak or something like that. By the time you get to the maxillary posterior, this bone back here, it's like styrofoam. You can take a number two pencil and just, just chip it out without doing anything. And then, and then someone will come in your office and they got an implant in the back in the number two area, another implant in the number six area. They got a big old five unit bridge on there and the whole thing's failing, it's flapping in the wind. And what does the dentist say? I don't want to place implants. I just want to restore implants. Well, that's like saying I want to know half the information, but make the decision on the whole thing. Go through the Mission Plan Institute. Um, if you don't want to go through MISH um, for whatever reason, there's another one. The ICOI, the International Congress of Oral Plantology, that's when I got my diplomat in. Um, call them, uh, call Jennifer Berg there at 1-888-449-ICOI. That's 1-888-449-ICOI or 1-800-442-0525, 1-800-442-0525. Uh, this is where Ken Judy is. He's, um, Ken Judy is another outstanding person. In fact, Mish uh, quotes Ken Judy uh, every hour on the hour. Ken Judy is also teamed up with MTS Manji through Exodent through 10 regional training courses. They take the United States, MTS Manji is taken by storm. They've broken up the United States into 10 regional centers, and he does a, a program with implants, a whole institute with Ken Judy, and you can call Expert M at 604 two seven eight five zero five nine that's expertent six zero four two seven eight five oh five nine and you remember who MTS that's the guy I was telling you about where um, when I started lecturing in 1990 all through Canada he was a household name and practice manager and he was with all the universities the Bank of Nova Scotia um, if, if MTS Manji valued your practice at X they would write you a loan for a hundred percent of it that's how much faith they had in this guy and when Gordon Christian needed an in-office consultant to do some practice transition with his son and do some other stuff and some consulting work, every practice management consultant, including myself, would have gone in there free of charge and just thought it was an honor. And Gordon called MTS Manji and paid full fee to have it done. Um, so MTS is a sharp, sharp guy. You've probably seen his ads around with Gordon and stuff like that. But anyway, um, Back to the implants. Your only limits are what you know for certain. You just don't have any training in implants. Most people graduated from dental school before implantology was really rock science. And a lot of people today go back and say, well, we knew a lot about implants at, you know, 1980, 1985. Yeah, you know, in hindsight, but at the time you weren't for sure uh, which one of these forks in the road was going to take you down the right road. Um, I have had um, Carl Mish on the cover of the uh, Ferrand Report. I've had a lot of articles written in there. Um, Ferrand reports 48 pages a month, no advertising allowed. There's no, it's not like the throwaway journals where you see a, an, ar an article here and opposing it's a full page ad. You know, most of the, uh, I shouldn't call them throwaway, that's disrespectful. Um, but, you know, the big ones, Dentistry Day, Dental Products Report, Dental Practice and Finance, Dental Economics, 50% of space advertising. Um, ours is you pay the advertising, kind of like HBO, no advertising, it's there for you. It goes in 38 countries around the world. Uh, Gordon was another person I did um, a lot of implant training with. Gordon used to said something in his all-day program here in Scottsdale. He comes to Scottsdale every year in April. Actually, does it every day for the Easter parade. It's always Gordon on Friday, the Easter parade on Saturday, and then Sunday the Easter Bunny comes. It's kind of a cool weekend. And uh, and Gordon sits there and he said in his lecture one day, I think it was an '87 or '88. For day of school, he goes, um, you know, placing an implant is easier than pulling a wisdom tooth. I thought. <laughs> What planet is this guy from? And it's kind of funny because over the years, every time I violently disagree with something Gordon Cruz said, it's usually taken somewhere between two to five years to realize that he's absolutely right and I'm a complete idiot. I can say that now because you already bought my tapes and you're already on day uh, 20 something. So uh, I didn't tell you that on the brochure. I just tell you that when you got this far. But call Gordon. He's got some implant course. He's got a two day surgical implant placement up at um, CRA. There are um, practical clinical courses, PCC, very concise, to the point. It's a two-day program, flying to Salt Lake, rent a car, driving out to Provo. And then he's got a two-day restorative. In fact, what he's been doing is he's been placing the restorative, uh, or the surgical, I believe, on Friday and Saturday 
and then the restorative on Monday and Tuesday. So if you want to blow the whole thing out from uh, Thursday to Tuesday, you can just do that. That's another incredible program. And once again, um, uh, MTS Bonji's uh, working with Gordon to get him to go around these 10 regional training centers to do that also. Or just go up to PCC and have it done up there. You can call 1-888-9778722. That's 1-888-977-8722 to ask about PCC courses. Um, or um, call Shelly Duncan. Uh, but anyway, there's so many programs in there. It's not a question if there's information, just will you go do it. Um, Gordon Christian said about MTS leadership programs, the course is highly useful for all practitioners regardless of specialty. Did you hear that? Regardless of specialty? Most practitioners have not had this level of organizational information at any time in their careers, Dr. Gordon Christian. Um, MTS is a sharp guy. Go listen to him. Um, he wants to become the CEO of your practice. He has an intensive three-day how-to course. Learn to lead, not manage. Develop a true patient-centered practice. I shut down my office for four days. Now, remember, I don't care what a course costs. When you shut down at today's dental, that's $10,000 a day lost revenue, so that's forty grand. Plus, my staff's still on the payroll. You know, my staff cost me about... Um, Gosh darn well, what's twenty uh what's twenty percent of two hundred thousand? And my staff cost me forty thousand a month whether I'm open and close. So I set out forty thousand dollars of production, uh pay the tuition, all that kind of stuff. This guy is worth go listen to this guy. Implants are a, a, a massively growing field um, for several reasons. A lot of, when I first got out of school, a lot of people told me, Why would you want to learn implants? From 1958 to 1963, the first five years, we have good dental insurance. The average dentist did a denture per day. And in 1960, the average American only had seven teeth. Well, now the average American in the year 2000 has 24 teeth, and an average dentist only does a denture a month. So as every day that goes by, these edentulous people that need implants are dying, and they're not being replaced. So it's a smalling, shrinking, shrinking pie. That's so fearfully falling forward. I'm flippantly flying freely, open-minded, people thinking abundancy have, have, uh, why don't you go to the 10 Qs of the publicly traded companies, the 10 Canyon reports, look at Noble BioCare just bought Stereos, um, there's billion dollar companies that sell implants, they're publicly traded, you can read their information, implants is exploding, why? Not because of little ladies with dentures, but because of ladies like this, ladies like that, go to her face, go, go to the slide, she's got a missing tooth. She's an American. For some reason, she doesn't want, quote, two good teeth filed down. Doesn't care if you file down her bone. Don't care if you take a block and decker and ream out her sinus. You're an American. You're going to get anything you want. This woman um, lost her front tooth. Very, very traumatic. When a woman loses her front tooth, it's extremely traumatic. When a man loses his, uh, has a glass eye, a big slash. You know, when you ever notice when two guys get together, if they got a scar, you know, if they, before they bond, man, they got to show each other a scar. I got this fishing and I got this in Vietnam and I got this one chewing with my dog. Women, they're the opposite. They go have a baby and it makes a little blue lane pop out of their lane. I can say this now because my wife's gone. They have to go to a cosmetic doctor to have something shot in there to have her spider vein removed. Hell, if a man had a baby, the rest of us, he'd walk around, yeah, and that was from my first baby, and this right here is from my second baby, and this big old knot vein coming out was from another baby. We're proud of our scars. Hell, they're, they're like a photo album of our life. Women, my gosh, they lose a front tooth. Um, it really uh, hacks them off. It's very emotional. In fact, look at dental malpractice lawsuits. I've said this to a women-driven industry from every angle. 89% of the partials and dentures that are converted to implant retained prostheses are women. Why? Uh, males keep saying that implants are for form, for fit, for function, occlusion. That's not true. They come into your office, you say, well, is there something you can't eat on a menu? They said, hell, I can eat the whole menu, the damn table, and the waiter. Look at me, I'm 400 pounds overweight. Well, what's the problem? Well, I just can't sleep with it in my mouth anymore. And, you know, I, I just, I, I can't go to bed. I got this denture when I was 20, married Frank at 21. We're 65. He's never seen me once without the denture in. And, you know, that, that's just, that's just, it's, it's for mental health, not human health. Same thing with gum disease. Women get two-thirds, 
66% of all the root plane care does. Go down to a periodontist, walk in there any day of the week and look at a schedule. It's Mary, Nancy, Susie, Nancy, Paula, Rayanne. It's not, oh, here's Jim from the foundry. He's worried he might lose a molar tooth. Look at the lawsuits. Almost 88% of all dental lawsuits are women between the ages of about 45 and 60. And what's this? Read Jeffrey Tonner's Dental Malpractice in a, um, it's in a Penwell Communication. I just had a hysterectomy. I just had a divorce. My husband left me for a younger woman. Uh, my life's almost in shatters. And then the straw broke the camel's back when he did a root canal in this tooth. And after my hysterectomy, and after my husband left me for a younger woman, then the whole world collapsed because that doctor pulled my tooth. That was the last straw. I mean, when you sit there and do a root canal on a 60-year-old man, and something goes wrong, and a year or two later you have to pull it, and you walk in and say, Frank, I'm sorry to tell you this. You know, I did the best I could. Um, we warranted everything five years. It is working. I'm going to refund your money. I'm really sorry, but um, we're going to have to pull this tooth. He always says, I told you to pull it when I come in here. Don't you remember? I said, just pull the son of a bitch. And you said, oh, no, we got to save it. I said, gosh darn it, I don't care, whatever, whatever. But I told you, remember, Howard, You, I told you, damn it. Usually they like the refund because they only paid 20% of the root canal. Insurance paid 80%, so they get the whole damn refund. Usually they're damn glad. And they go, really, man, I got all I paid $100 for the root canal. I get $500. Usually they're, they run out of the office all the way to the casino. And uh, usually it's enough money they hang on to for almost an hour. And uh, so, but basically these people, um, back to the slide, these people, it's a women driven industry. They make 89% of all appointments, 89% of all partial dentures convert to implant retained prosthesis, two thirds of all periodontal therapy, periodontal surgery, and uh, stay there. And uh, I'll go forward. Let's, let's go to the slide. And uh, this woman lost her front tooth. She does not, after losing that front tooth, she doesn't want anybody to touch the one next to it, the one on the other side, you know, someone done a root canal and a post and a crown and it fractured, yada, yada, yada. She doesn't want anything to ever touch those teeth. So we sit there and we put in the implant crown, watch the lip line, watch expectations. Satisfaction equals perceptions minus expectations. You know, men are 27% more muscle mass than women. The corners of your mouth are attached to your cheekbone. And if the corners of your mouth are attached to your cheekbone, when you smile, those muscles contract. And women with thin lips, if they smile and they show upper gums, you have got to get rid of their high expectations. But that's about, that's her giggling about as loud as she can. So that's about a perfect uh, candidate for an, uh, a crown implant number eight. Um, there I am stretching her lips up over the top of her head and I can barely get to the top of this crown, okay? That's the perfect time you want to do an implant crown. You do not want to do uh, number eight, a implant and a crown for a high lip line unless you have done this a lot. Carl Misch calls it the aesthetic health compromise. If they're going to show it, you can make it look great, but you're going to compromise the cleansability of it and some other things like that. Um, stay on the slide there. We'll, um, so there's, uh, we'll show this. Uh, there's pulling it up. They're showing you. That looks pretty darn good. Uh, she was very pleased with it. Uh, she liked it. Uh, here's another woman talking about, you know, she, uh, gosh darn, here's a gorgeous woman. She didn't want anybody to touch that first like us, but anybody touch that molar. Why? Because why is that other tooth filled? Well, it had had a crown. Someone did a root canal on it. The root canal didn't work. I forgot the story on that. Um, but something went wrong with it. Uh, she came in. Um, I don't even know where she was from. And uh, she wanted to implant. There's a five millimeter wide. I want to point something out that's five millimeter wide. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to motivate you to get to the mission suit. I'm just trying to motivate you in the safe to get to Ken Judy or join the ICOI. But you know, dentists always think of implants that they got to place them real long. Well, I don't care if you place an implant that went all the way, all the way throughout the top of their head, went out the head, wrapped around the moon six times. When the thing snaps, when the implant fails, it doesn't so much come out. It snaps at the gum line, okay? If it comes out, that's a, it never attached, never got firm, some infection, you put too much pressure, place the implant, you burn the bone, infection, sterility, something like that. But if an implant snaps, it snaps at the gum line. It's not how long is your implant so much as when it snaps, it's how wide it is, it's the width. And if you look at this tooth here, go to the slide. There's a, that's a five millimeter wide implant, and she loves this because no one touched a tooth in front of it, no one touched tooth behind it. In fact, what I want to do in that tooth, I want to do a little bridge where, you know, the bicuspid already had a DO filling, and the molar had MO filling. I said I wouldn't touch her tooth, I'd just take out the silver fillings, take an impression, and make a, uh, a basically a, uh, 
a DO, you know, a Maryland insert bridge. She didn't want it. So we did an implanted crown. There she wrote. And uh, there's the front view. And there she is when she's all done. And uh, she's absolutely gorgeous. And there she is there. And, and it's her priority. That's the, that's the birth of implants. These women, these modern day American women, they do not want their teeth filed down for a crown, but they don't care if you take a Black & Decker drill and drill a hole in their jawbone. Why do they worship enamel and they don't worship alveolar crest bone? I have no idea, but I don't need to know why because I am not gonna dogmatically force feed the market. And the other thing about that is when that tooth was pulled, remember, her insurance pays for her needs. That tooth was pulled, they pay 80% of the extraction, and they pay 50% of the three unit bridge. So the insurance would have picked up 80% of the extraction, 50% of the bridge. She said, no way. I said, well, it doesn't cover implant occurrence. She said, I don't care. Well, this is what I don't understand. You charge a certain fee for root canals and crowns because you have to get the fee approved by the insurance. They say, we pay 80% of a root canal up to this fee, usual and customary fee of the UCR or usual and custom, I think it's unusually crummy rate or usual and customary rate, whatever it is. And, um, and same thing for cleanings, you know, you'll sit there and say, well, we tried to submit $70 of Delta for a cleaning, but they only, but they wouldn't approve it. So we resubmit it for 65 and they approved it. Or the PPO says we can only charge 70 for a cleaning or we can only charge 500 for a crown. Well, if it's not covered by insurance, the hell are you giving it away for? And I said, I said, well, a bridge is $700 of two times three. So it's $2,100 insurance pay half. And an implant and a crown is 3000 Why would you charge the same for an implant and a crown when you sit there and got to go to the mission institute five three-day weekends? You got to buy a $5,000, $10,000 drill. I like $5,000 of the inventory. I wanted my staff to go. I go to the ICLI convention, this, that, this, and that. People, you have to amortize the cost in. The specialists can all go take continuing ed because they price accordingly. If you charge $500 for a root canal and I charge $700, I can afford to take continuing ed, get the 300 RPM nitites, the Tulsa Dental product stuff, uh, the Root ZX, the digital radiography. I can make a Cadillac all day long if I got everything needed to make a Cadillac. But if you don't have the equipment you need, the edu uh, information you need, remember, it's technology. It's technology, technology, technology. It's continuing education. If you don't profitably price this stuff, you can't get it. The reason I know this stuff is because I charge out just like the specialist. I don't even price out implants. I just call up oral surgeon, what do you chase, charge for an implant, bone graft, whatever, whatever, whatever. Whatever they're charging, your average oral surgeon runs about a 40 to 45% overhead. And then you call them up and say, what do you charge for an implant? They say, a oh, 1,000 implant. Uh, four, 4,000 for a bone graft, yada, yada. They just rattle off, you know, 3,500 sinus lift, yada, yada, yada. Whatever it is in your backyard, you charge that. Then you sit there and say, well, you know, the next time you go to the course, why don't you call me up and I'll go with you? When are you going? Oh, yeah, we're going out there. And I waited till this because out Maui and we're going to golf and go to this course. Uh, here's another one. And some of these implants, uh, here's some earlier ones that, uh, uh, didn't look as pretty, didn't turn out as nice, but the patient liked them. Uh, there it is. There's another thing. Going for width, 5.0. And, um, you know, they're just really valued that they didn't have to have two. Here, here they really were talking about virgin teeth. I've never seen two teeth get it on, but evidently they have because they're always telling me which ones of their teeth are virgin and which ones aren't. And they just didn't want any teeth filed down. And they said, oh, my gosh, I lost this tooth for whatever, whatever, whatever. And uh, he wanted to file this tooth down and file this tooth down. I said, no way. And my girlfriend said, it's always my girlfriend said, I've never to this day, 12 years of practice, 12,000 years, I've never had a person say to me, my gosh, the man next door walked over my house and told me about this great dentistry did. It's always my girlfriend said that you put those little silver screws in there and you don't have to file down my adjacent teeth. Hear what they're saying, little silver screws? Here's a lady comes in my office. Um, been getting her teeth clean every six months. Absolutely hate her partials. And so she hate her partials. So what do we do? We turn her to there. How do we do that? That's a, uh, here's a side view. Just, you know, just, just do it. There's a view. Just placing implants, having fun, giving her what she wanted, 
There's another view. All titanium implants, all single units. How do you what, how do you need to treat? What do you need to be thinking about when you treat implant for implants? Number one. Number one, I treatment plan and implant for an implant for every root. Why? Okay, take this bridge right here. Okay, there's three implants in a row. If I place an implant in the first bicuspid, and an implant in the second molar. If one implant fails, I lost the whole damn thing. I lost the three unit bridge, one implant, one mathematical risk, I lost the whole case. Whereas I place three individual implants, one implant fails, I still got two. I don't care which two. I don't care which implant fails, I still got two. I would simply take out the failed implant and impress for a three unit bridge. Don't ever treatment plan. When people say, well, implants have a 97% a success rate. Well, you know what? That three out of 100 failures would eat the profit out of half your implant case. I mean, failures are hugely expensive. You can't make 10 or 15% margin on an implant case and then have one out of every 20 cases fail. Because that one out of 20 cases that fails eats the profits of half your cases. And the other thing is, can you imagine you do an implant case on a 65-year-old uh, woman, then she comes in at 75, one implant failed, so you lost the whole bridge, but now she's 75 and she's frail, maybe she's got cancer, maybe she's got osteoporosis, maybe she's sick, maybe she's on an oxygen tube, maybe a thousand other things, and, and, and now you're saying, well, now we're going to have to go to removable, and she's like gagging and choking, and she's got, um, you know, the reason senior citizens do, do so poor with dentures is mainly because they dry up. I mean, dentures and parcels really rely on a lot of saliva, a lot of mucus, a lot of serous fluid to make that seal. And when you and when your mouth starts drying, I remember when you were little kids. I don't care where my um, I don't care where I put my little kids down to sleep. When I wake up, there's at least one, usually two, sometimes three. In my gosh darn bed, okay. And when they're laying there sleeping, you know, they always got big old wet spots drooling out. If you ever walk by their class, like say you've been out of town and you think you'll surprise them, you come out in town, you've been gone a couple of days, you walk by their school, you want to you see them in their classroom and watch them studying, because you know, they're in private school, it's $8,000 a year per child, and every time I snuck out one of my kids in private school, they always look like this. <laughs> and then when I wake them up, you know, the paper's tucked to their face, and you peel it off and say, gosh, son, I'm glad you're not in public school, I'm glad I'm paying $8,000 a year for you to sleep here instead, and uh, they just drool, all they do is drool. Then you'll notice grandma comes out to your house. And you send grandma to bed, what does she do? She always takes a glass of water. She goes, uh, well, I'm going to take a glass of water because my mouth's real dry and my mouth gets dried out and I don't have any saliva. Why do seniors get root surface decay? Why do babies get baby bottle tooth decay? Why do seniors get root surface decay? Those, I saw that same reason you need to learn how to do implants. Well, let's go back to a baby. Why does a baby get baby bottle tooth decay? It goes back to why do, uh, how do we find out women have maternal instincts? When a baby cuts themselves, he licks it. If he can't reach it, his mother licks it. Why? Saliva's got stuff in there. It's got Ig antibodies, IgC antibodies, antiviral mucal glycoproteins, protease enzymes. It's got all kinds of good stuff in there. And if a baby can't reach it, his mom will lick it, and it just flows with saliva. Well, a baby can drink a bottle all day long. They just walk around drinking their bottle. They're drinking their milk. They're salivating. Everything's fine. But what happens if a baby goes to bed with a bottle in its mouth? Well, now... Now the, the, uh, the tongue's protecting the lower tooth, uh, the nipples laying up underneath the front four incisors, milk drools out on the teeth, the baby falls asleep, the baby quits salivating, there's no saliva uh, to have a white blood cell, to have a T cell, uh, or to have a B cell, go tell a T cell it just saw a bug, to go tag it so a polymorphonucleoside can come by and phagocytize that, and you wake up and there's just holes all throughout your front teeth. That's baby bottle tooth decay. Well, same thing with root surface decay. Why does a senior, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, just have a cavity right out there in the middle of nowhere? Because she doesn't have any saliva. The saliva is a, is a transportation, so roads or bridge for the immune system in the mouth. It'd be kind of like if everybody had a car, but we bombed out all the roads and bridges. No white blood cells, no antibodies, no defense uh, can take place if they dry up saliva, and now out of nowhere, there's root surface decay. When they get root surface decay, it ain't imagine if you drilling all the decay out and getting a good seal in the feeling. Uh, my gosh, it's like uh, it's like watching an, an AIDS person. You start losing your immune system, you die of anything. You die of the common cold. I've lost at least 10 patients. I've already lost a classmate. Uh, one of my best buddies in a uh, um, dental school, uh, Craig Pence, already died. And uh, we said I've had several patients die. And man, when they get farther along in their disease, 
They, uh, my gosh, just anything takes them over. So um, root surface decay, they have no saliva. It's not about margins. Make sure you make these people bleaching trays and make sure you give them Colgate. You know, Colgate makes over-the-counter toothpaste, 1,000 part per million. They also make prescription toothpaste, 5,000 part per million. Make sure you make them trays when they got root surface decay. Fill up that tray, soak their teeth in it for four minutes every night, and uh, very important. Well, that's the same thing why dentures fail. What I want you to do, if you're wondering about you make partials, you make dentures, or you got people that come in and get their partials relined, but you're not sure um, if you want to place implants, and, and you don't really restore many implant cases. Once again, why? Because you don't understand implants. Since you don't understand implants, you don't have enough knowledge about it to combine it with the passion and fever to sell it. You don't sell knowledge, you sell passion. If you don't have any knowledge, doctor, you won't have any passion to sell it. Why won't you do this on Sunday? On Sunday, instead of going to church, you know, where you're sitting in pews and they just stand there, uh, uh, yeah, um, God's up there, but I'm his broker and give me money. Instead of, you know, dealing with God's broker on Sunday, why don't you go read the Bible where it says, visit the sick, visit the elderly, and take your four boys and go visit a nursing home. When you go into a nursing home, you'll find out that not only do at least one in four, so one in two people not have any teeth, where are all their teeth? Where are they? They're in the drawer. Well, you know, how come this denture fit for 40 years? What do, what do you think it needs border molded? What do you think it needs a, a new reline? People, they have 80 year old dry, brittle tissue. I don't care if you get a perfect impression, if they're dried out, and not to mention, you sit there and say, well, you know, I have 80 year olds and they, they have plenty of saliva. Are they on 10 different medications? You know how many medications dry out the mouth? Hell, if they're in a lot of pain, they're just taking a lot of Tylenol, it'll dry out the mouth. I called up the 88-1-800-618-099, asked for their pharmacology department, asked them to Xerox me or to mail me out a list of all the drugs prescription and over-the-counter that cause zero stomine drying out the mouth. You know how many there were? It's something like 880 drugs. You go in there, the average person in a nursing home is on 11 different prescription medications. Their mouth's all dry. They got foam in the corner, dentures in the bottom drawer. And then you're walking around seeing how miserable they are. Then you walk down to the cook. You walk down to the cafeteria and you say, God, what are we having today? Uh, rubber chicken, rice pilaf, broccoli, steamed rice. What are we having? He goes, are you kidding? If it ain't mush, they all complain. We got to have macaroni and cheese and bread pudding and just mush. Anyway, we make something nice. We got to throw it in a blender, liquefy, mushify. These people have horrible nutrition. They're blocked up. They don't have fiber. They need their gosh darn teeth. Why don't they have any teeth? Because dentists, the same low self-esteem, numb nut dentist, who's looking at a 12-year-old by cuspid with a bunch of crap in the pits and fissures, who's saying, well, I wouldn't do a preventative res restoration. I just watch it. That's the same pediatrician who wouldn't give a kid a vaccine for measles, mumps, rubella, tuberculosis, diphtheria, whooping cough, um, hepatitis C, chicken pox, whatever, because he doesn't think uh, it's a good investment. He thinks it's okay if you buy Nikes and a Garth Brooks CD, eat at Taco Bell two times a week, get a $100,000 house and a jet ski, but he doesn't want you to spend any money in your gosh darn teeth. And then because you've been under his care every six months since you were a child, and the same tight-ass dentist never learned about ortho, um, he watched you with a malocclusion, uh, orthopedic problem, a crossbite where you're eating your own teeth, from basically six years old to 18. Now you need orthognathic surgery. You're gonna break all your teeth down, all your dentistry fails, and you're either gonna have to wear a rubber bite splint every night or something fun like that. Same guy who watched you come in his office every five years and get a reline, who never said to you, you know what, Margaret? You know, I keep reading this. I, I've said this so many times and it works all day long. I said, you know what, Margaret? You know, you're 65, you're 62 years old. And your husband told me that he's going to work two or three more years and retire. And you know what? I am your family dentist. And I don't do a specialty where all I work is on bark on one tree. I see the whole forest. I have people that come in here from three to 103 years old, okay? And you know what? You've been coming in here for uh, five years. And you're 62 years old. You came in here five years ago and your partial wasn't quite right working. And um, we relined it. And that was back in 1987. And now you're here in 1992. And you're having me check this and you got a sore spot here. Mary, we need to sit down. I need to talk to you. I have the spouse, the husband in the room, the other decision maker. And I get him in here and look. And I say, Mom and Dad, look. You came in here 1987. You were 57 years old. And you had a problem with your denture, we relined it. 
Okay, here you are back five years later, you're 62, and I got the intro camera, she's sitting in the chair, um, you know, I ask her privately, um, has your husband ever seen you without, is this embarrassing, whatever, they almost all say, don't let my husband in here say that, um, so I sit there and I say, well, um, sir, we got the camera out, and she's got an ulcer there, okay, now look, you're 62, how many prescription medications are you on, see, you're, you're not even taking anything, okay, you're 62 years old, uh, how, when, when did, how old were you when you got this denture? She says, 18. I said, how long did you wear it before you first had to get a new one or reline or do anything with it? And she said, 25 years. Okay, 25 years, you never touched it. You know why? Because you were young, you were healthy, you had saliva, you had mucus, you had a strong, young, healthy, resilient organism mouth, okay? Now you came in here at 57, you had some problems. It's five years later, 62, you have some problems. I want you to this. Are you guys, uh, are you guys religious? Do you go to church or anything like that? What church you go to? Oh, really? That, did you know your pastor comes here? And his wife and his children, all that kind of stuff. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's right. Yada, yada, yada. I said, well, I'll tell you what. What's Pastor Don's favorite um, nursing home or daycare? He's involved. I know he's involved with this one, this one, this one. I want you to do this. If you don't believe me, I'll meet you down there. But I want you to go down there. Sunday, instead of going to church, sitting in a pew, being bored for an hour, why don't you do this? Why don't Sunday... You read the eight Beatitudes, visit the sick, bury the dying, whatever. Um, it's really good training for the kids, you know, because little kids naturally, I don't know why, they're scared of old people. You know, my three-year-old hangs on this leg, and my five-year-old, they're like, ah, like they're going to bite him or something. Go down there, and these people are lonely. Their kids never visit them. Go down there and visit them, and you promise to me you'll take a sheet of paper, a pen or a pencil, and you will visit everybody in one wing. You know, it's usually 10 rooms on side and maybe 20 rooms. And you go in there and you write down. How many of you go in there and say, Hi, me and my husband were just out for a walk and we thought we'd stop by, you know, and bring him a flower, a daisy or something. Or if you got a dog or a cat, bring it in there because a the god dang blood-sucking government won't let them have a dog in a nursing home. They're all in there lonely. All they want is a dog or a cat. And the blood-sucking government won't even let a dog go in there. You go in there with your colon rotten out, hanging on the floor. You can go in there dribbling all over yourself. You can go in there drooling all over yourself. But you can't bring in a dog or a cat. And these people are lonely. Uh, that, 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 that alone should be a case just to shut down the state government. And go in there and visit these people. And notice how many of them don't have any teeth. Or they, and then say to them, well, Mary, do you have your teeth? And she's like, oh, that's right. They're in the bottom drawer. How do you like the cafeteria? Go down and talk to her doctor, constipated, not eating right, non-nutrition. Go down to the cafeteria and look at the crap they serve them. They, they give them this big healthy lunch, and the only thing she eats is the macaroni and cheese and the bread pudding and the lemon meringue pie. She can't eat the chicken, she can't eat the broccoli, she can't eat the vegetables, she can't eat the fruit. So all she's eating is non-fiber mush, and she's sitting down there, and what's the deal? You say, well, honey, what, um, what about your teeth? Can you wear those teeth? Oh, no, they hurt. And she's on medications. They're drying her mouth. Everything's all straight. Let me tell you something. You got a denture at 18. You had no problems with it for the first 25 years. Then you were in here at 57. Now you're in here at 62. And you see that man there? I don't care if he thinks this is expensive or not because he'll go out and buy a nice car. But you know what? The last 10 years of your life, you're not going to have a car. Last 10 years of your life, you might not even have a house. And you're going to need to eat three to four times a day. And you're not going to have a car. And you're not going to have a house. And I feel like right now you're under my care. And I think that um, your husband's going to retire in two or three years. He's going to lose his, uh, maybe his dental benefits. Or maybe he has stronger earning power now and than he does when he retires. But I'm telling you what. Uh, I don't want to reline a denture on a lady who's having her second problem with it within five years. She's over 50 years old. And you know, the average man only lives to be uh, 73, but the average woman lives to be 77. You're going to live, on average, four years longer than your husband. In fact, you'll notice in the nursing home, there's 100 women and one man named Lucky, and usually the men only last for about two weeks after they go into a nursing home. They usually boink themselves to death within a week or two. And uh, you're going to need to eat. You're not going to have saliva. You're not going to have mucus. You're not going to have serous fluid. I want you to spend some time in the nursing home because I think, uh, number one, even if you brought in these old ladies from the nursing home, 80, 90 years old, they're not healthy enough. They don't have a dime. Uh, even if it was charity, I don't know if they would handle this type of trauma like you can now. But I really think you're a massive candidate for oral implantology. I would go in there and put in some titanium implants, some beautiful teeth, and you'll be eating chicken and rice pull off and apples and oranges uh, until you, the day you die. For all you know, you live to be 100. How old was your mother when she died? And she go, my, my mother's still alive. 
You're telling me you're 62 and you still have a mom? How old is she? Well, she's 87. And you're in here twice in five years with denture, and that's with saliva and mucus of a 63-year-old? Don't dry out and get caught with a denture at 80 years old. It's not worth it. Especially when you can do a case like this. Here's a lady came in. She had a case. There she was. You know, and what I charge for that? Never itemize that. Insurance isn't going to pay for it. You don't sit there and say, well, uh, uh, let's see. Well, I need an implant here and here and here. So that's 2000 and, and a crown is 600 So that'll be, uh, that'll be uh, uh, 3200 And she needs three over here. So an implant's 1000 Now that's 3000 and a crown 700 People, just look at the case. You got $5,000 drills. The implants are expensive. The courses are expensive. Just shoot a case out. I looked in that and I told her, I said, you know, we could replace the lower. I said, I do 15 grand an arch. And I don't care if it's two implants, three implants or whatever. Uh, she came in for an hour and a half appointment. I sunk, uh, how many did I sink here? I don't even remember this case. Um, I don't know how many I sunk, four or five. And, uh, and they came back, uh, you know, uh, six months later, placed the crowns there. And then a lot of people say, well, gosh, did you have to price that much? Hey, if any, you know how much you're going to have to babysit this? That's another thing. You want implants to get profitability. You give instruction, you give a warranty, you be very clear with the warranties. I tell these people, look, I'm going to put an implant there, I'm going to put a crown. If, you, if something's a little loose, you want me to check in it, or you want me to tie it, or you want me to do this. I don't place implants and crowns and then have you come in every month the rest of your life to have me check this or check this. I place this case and I say, I, I will warrant it. If the implant fails, I'll replace it my cost for five years like I do anything else, okay? If, the, if something fails, I stand behind it five years. But, every, but after six months, every time you come in, you want me to check this, tweak that, look at this, smooth this, whatever, it's 200 bucks a visit. It's $200 for an implant visit. That way it makes them think, you know, do I really, you know, I mean, because I don't know what it is. It's always like, why wouldn't you look at this? Okay, I looked at it. Now what do you want me to do? Okay, I'm done. And, you know, they go home. Uh, I don't give little old ladies a free incentive to come have social hour with a gosh darn dentist every day, uh, or they'll do it, okay? See Medicare and Medicaid. No co-payments. It's absolutely a joke. Uh, so these people, they love these implant cases. And if you're telling me, uh, that you can't place an implant, um, it's just because, you know, here she was, no upper teeth, here she is later, uh, here's a before, here's an after. Uh, oh, this woman absolutely loved it. Let me go, go up close to that. Yeah, there's before, um, she had an upper partial and a lower denture, and look at how people smile, look at how they smile on the left, go up close to that again. Look at they smile on the left and they have upper partial. They don't want to draw attention. But man, when those teeth are in there and they won't come out and you can hear her saying, look at that old smile. She is happier than hell. Gorgeous woman. Um, your biggest, the number one problem in dentistry today is that dentists still do not clearly explain in written detail the expected expense before the treatment started. We still have tens of thousands of dentists named Dr. Ambiguous saying, well, don't worry about the fee, I'll write it up, I'll itemize it, I'll do this, I'll do that. And then what do you do? You say, well, the implants are about $1,000 and you'll need five. So the patient goes, okay, 5000 And the crowns are about $500 a piece and you'll need about ten. So that's not 5000 So they say, okay, 10000 And they go home and it's 10000 and then they get the bill. There's five implants for a thousand, five thousand. Uh, ten crowns for five hundred piece. That's five thousand. And then you got a gosh darn bone graft in there for five thousand. You got a, you got a uh, this and that and this and that. And the whole thing by the time it's itemized is twenty two thousand. Don't sit and say about this, about this, about that. You know, you want to play about? I'll throw you a hand grenade and tell you about when it's going to go off. Okay. Don't say about Dr. and Biggest, write everything down. And you know what? If you wrote down and for uh, all, if you itemize the thing. And told her it was gonna be twenty thousand. She probably would have done anyway. But when you tell her it's ten, and then she gets twenty, it's satisfaction equals perception minus expectations. I was expecting ten. I'm perceiving a bill for twenty thousand dollars. I am shocked. And oh, and then with the warranty, exactly what will you warranty? I don't care if you won't warranty it for a day. There's a lot of dentistry I don't warranty at all. I get some of these cases. Whenever a dentist friend of yours refers you a case, yeah, thanks, pal. Uh, you know what I mean? Whenever a friend, Dennis, is referring you a case, you got to think to yourself, okay, why does he not want this case? Because he has a brain cell. Why are you doing the case? Because you're an idiot, okay? Um, you like the challenge, whatever. But some of these cases, I will sit down and I'll say, well, you know, this is what I would do. You don't want to do that. This is what you want to do. Okay, I want to do this. You don't want to do that. You want to do this. So here's the deal. Jan, get out the warranty. And I take a pen, cross out this, cross out that. I sign here. You sign here. You sign there. And I'll say, okay, here's the deal. 
I'll do what you want, but I'm not warranting it, or I'll warranty it for six months, or if you come back, here's the deal, yeah. Or sometimes I'll just do, I'll, a patient will come in, I'll just set them up, and you know, maybe it's a bombed out tooth root canal, I'll say, Frank, here's the deal. I think I can save this tooth root canal. I want to do it because, man, God, it's too hopeless. But this isn't your standard healthy tooth where I'll say, I'll do a root canal warranty at five years. Um, if you're really worried about the money and you really want to value your money, we probably ought to pull this thing. I'm willing to do this. I usually warranty my root canals five years. Uh, no question asked. You get teeth in the air six months. But on this one, I'll, I'm only going to go two years. So you want to do it? You want to sign here and cross out the five, put two years? If we pull it in two years in a month, uh, that was your deal, and you'd have to look at the value of this root canal bone crown down in tooth for two years, because it's kind of right on. I mean, you, usually my cutoffs, I got decay to the bone line, I pull it, and your decay is, I mean, it's just almost to the bone. If he says, hell no, then pull the damn thing. I don't want to mess with it. You're there. But if it's a woman, 45, 59, she goes, did I tell you about my hysterectomy? My husband ran off with his secretary, and, uh, you know, you better be careful. Get everything written, expected up front. Not discussing fees before treatment is a human relations crime. And uh, have your, uh, you know, your, you enter the stuff in the computer, you print out, you have your office manager here, go and cut, go to cut up here. See this blonde here on the right? That's the ugliest patient we've ever had. Every patient we've had is at least that good looking or better, I wish. And, uh, but you sit there and, and you look at this, you, you got the x-rays there, um, you got the fees, it's all written out. There's a lot of practice management experts on cassettes and books saying, do not write down what they need and do not put the fees, because you know what they'll do? They'll get a second opinion. Well, guess what? Guess why they're saying that? Well, think about it. Which, there's only three business strategies. Best price, best product, best service. Which one did I say was the least defensible? Best price. Someone can always beat you by a penny. When someone's saying, well, I wrote everything down, I wrote down the fee, and it came to $5,000, and they ran across the street and had it done for $4,999, what the hell does that say about, are you a relationship business, best service, or are you a transaction business, best price? Um, do you have best product? Uh, was it all tooth colored? I mean, when, they, when HMOs say free filling, free cleanings, free exam. I'm sorry, what was that free exam? Was it a, a Panky Institute exam? Was it Peter Dawson's exam? Was it Gordon Christen's exam? Or was it, gosh darn, some uh, a PA? You know, was it an FMX? See this FMX here? I still cannot believe how many dentists will come in the office and say, um, well, you mean you, you take an FMX? Oh, I, you take a lot of FMX. Insurance company, an insurance company wrote me a letter one time, told me I take too many full mouth surveys. I said, hey, asshole, there's 54 dental schools. If I walked into a dental school anywhere in the United States and I had a PA of a tooth and I started to do a root canal bill up crown because I had a toothache, they probably, they probably use physically hurt me, okay? How can you walk up to a tree and start saying, oh, it's got termites, what if you took a whole FMX, you know, I'd find out hell, the forest on fire. Who cares about the termites? They'll die in the fire. And you can't start, gosh darn, dental treatment in dental school without a complete exam, a full set of x-rays. And I would have taken, uh, I would have had a lot of x-rays transferred, but the patients always say they don't have access to them, or they say they're going to get a transfer. They never do. We end up taking a new set, whatever. But uh, I'm not going to let an insurance company intimidate me and end up from the state board or in front of a lawsuit with a PA and a bite wing while they bring in all their experts and say, is this a, you know, um, you're guilty till proven innocent. They already fail you for the x-rays, the diagnosis, and the treatment plan guilty till proven innocent because doctors have an asymmetrical amount of information that they have to act as an agent on behalf of the consumer. When we're trading pigs and chicken, we're equal. But when we're doctors and dentists and lawyers, we know we have eight years of college in one little narrow specialty that they don't. So the courts say we are an agent acting on their behalf. So our treatment plan, our x-rays and our diagnosis are failed until we prove the right. And that's why I have full mouth survey. I do full six point probing. I take all, all that stuff and usually photos. And uh, I can itemize it because I'm not worried about best price. I mean, if they want to go get something a penny cheaper, they wouldn't have been at today's cell anyway. They got a relationship. They've seen the facility. They, they can smell the technology, the enthusiasm, the uniforms, name tags, the whole nine yards. Uh, they know it's best service and they get a sense as best product. Confrontational interfaces test your confrontational tolerance. Confrontational interfaces 
Test your confrontational tolerance. That's why you don't state the fees. That's why you don't give it to them in writing. That's why you don't flip the warranty right out of the sheet and say, hey, Harry, I usually warranty these five years, no question asked for you, it's gonna be two. And I'll tell you why. Why does, why, why does this, um, and I know a lot of people say, well, Howard, that's easy for you because you know, you're know you socially retarded and you're kind of a jerk, but I'm a sensitive, caring, loving guy and it's hard for me to do this. Well, then have your receptionist do it. Have your assistant do it. Um, have the person working your account receivables do it, okay? Uh, call Visa 1-800-VISA-311 for a fee visa sign. You're not going to sell big case dentistry until you start getting some financing. You know, a lot of people say, I can't believe that you charge 15,000 arch for implants and doesn't matter if there's three or four or five or whatever. Guess I, I, I don't know how to itemize a case. I mean, I'm going to be in there and I'm going to do the same diagnosis, the same surgery is going to be length time. It doesn't matter if I drew a one hole or two hole. I don't know how you take a qualitative. It'd be like telling an artist, well, uh, paint this painting and we're going to paint and we're going to, we're going to charge you by the brush stroke. Well, the brush stroke has nothing to do with it. It rivet a hole, a deal. It's the case. And if you walk in there and say the case is 15 grand, I need the money now. Sure, you don't sell a case like that. But when you call American General Finance and you walk in there and say, well, Mary, um, to replace that lower denture is going to be 15,000. You say you're not having problems with the upper. Uh, and you wouldn't have problems with the upper because the reason the upper feels so good right now is because your lower sucks. But I'll tell you this. When I nail down the lower and I put implants and a denture on the lower, you will immediately have problems with the upper. You know why? Because now the lower doesn't move, and compared to the lower, now the upper sucks. The only reason your upper's good is because the lower really, really, really sucks, okay? The only reason why my wife married me is because she grew up in a town of 2000 and didn't know that some guys were tall, dark, and handsome. So everything is relative, okay? And if you walk in there and say, this thing's 15,000, uh, you know, and, and you get their name, number, social security number, fax that stuff in. By the time we present to them, they'll walk, if it's a big case, we'll go back in there and say, uh, Margaret, um, we need your social security number. And she'll tell us, yeah, yeah. So we'll walk back in there and say, okay, well, Mary, you must have a very good line of credit. You must be very good. Uh, blah, 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 blah. You know, if to do this lower denture, to have her implants, $15,000. We've already faxed your name, number, social security, and American General Finance, and they here's here's what they've approved you for. Um, you can sit there and pay a thousand dollars a month for eighteen months, or you can pay two hundred dollars a month for sixty months. Yada 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 yada. Now the patient ain't looking at fifteen thousand. They're saying, well, I know what my free cash flow is, and I have I have two three hundred dollars extra a month because I just paid off my car payment for my Pontiac. And, and I got about two, three hundred. In fact, in fact, my car payment used to be two eighty a month, and I made my last car payment two months ago. And you're saying I could have a Cadillac lower implant retained prosthesis for two hundred and fifty dollars a month? Yada yada yada. That's how you sell it in installment credit. If it cost over a thousand dollars in America in the last five years, eighty percent of it was finance. Uh, sign up for Care Credit. Care Credit's another one. It's kind of like American General Finance. It's another one, care credit. This it does these things. 1-800-300-3046. It's 1-800-300-3046. Uh, look up loans in your yellow page. See who makes consumer loans in your area. It's amazing. Some of you guys are in towns where you said you're having problems with this company, problems with that company. Well, maybe it's your demographics. And the big national, something's it's not quite right in your demographics. Maybe you had a factory closed down, and so the data is showing a lot of unemployed people here or a lot of bad credit here, so they just shut down your zip code. Well, that means that someone's, remember the uh, business strategies, uh, market differentiation, differentiate your product to someone else in like a commodity versus cost leadership versus target market, niche market. Well, whenever a credit zone goes bad nationally, someone always comes up there locally and takes a niche market, open up a yellow page, and you'll say, yeah, consumer loans, right in your area. Now you're dealing with someone that's usually maybe within three, four, five miles of your office. If it's a small town under 10,000, hell, you probably know the guy. Remember dental school, they always told you if a lady comes in, go a close up on this. They always told you now, school, you know, beware of a lady. If a lady comes in with a bag full of dentures, run. She's psychotic. She's neurotic. I mean, think about it. She's already been to five different guys. She's just a nut. She's just a fruitcake. And she's unreasonable. She's unreasonable. She's unreasonable. Did any dawn on anybody that maybe that she, she's got five different dentures because she's truly that miserable? Why is the customer always guilty and we sit around and 
you know, and like, uh, oh, well, if you've gone to five different dentists and all dentists are good and these were all done acceptable and I think you need Prozac or lithium or ought to be taken behind the barn and shot, maybe she's not a candidate for dentures. Maybe, look at that picture. This woman is miserable. This woman walked in my office and I said, come on. I said, why don't you have to do, why don't you do an implant? And she said, everybody said she wasn't a candidate. She didn't have enough bone. God, look at this lady's jaw. Go a close up of that. Hell, when I first saw the pano, I asked her if her daddy was Muhammad Ali. And uh, she said, no. And I said, was your mama Joe Frazier? I mean, you, I told her, I said, you know, you got more jawbone than a Neanderthal. And uh, she didn't think that was very, I told her that was a compliment. And then I uh, gave her a banana and left the room. And, uh, but I mean, come on, look at that. She, I mean, you know, these people are miserable. Um, lower dentures, bars, clips, hard to say. A lot of people, there's two schools of camp. Some people will put four balls. Stay on this picture. I was thinking to do this. Some people will put four implants with balls on there, and then they'll make a lower denture with little rubber O-rings to snap on there, okay? There's one school camp that does that. Gordon likes that. Stereos does all those. Um, then there's another school of camp like Carl. He didn't like that. He likes bars. Um, I don't really care. Um, you know, I, I first default on implants to Carl because that's all he does. Most of the other experts at implants are trying to do uh, two things, three things, ten things, hundred things. Um, Carl only does implants. That's all he does. And he's obsessed with implants. And uh, so I, I kind of follow the bar theory. The other thing is try to find a lab that only does implants. In fact, we got a lab out here in Arizona and he doesn't even want to get me your name because um, he's way, way, way too booked up. But try to find it. You can, you, if you have to have it, you can call Jan. And uh, he gets mad at me actually when I do that. In fact, he's mad at me now because uh, he says, quit having people call me from all over. But it's uh, Red Mountain Dental Labs out here in, uh, I believe it's in Mesa, Arizona. Red Mountain Dental Labs. It's Colin Gibb. And uh, Colin only does implants. And uh, my gosh, you know, work with your local guy. Um, you can do implants with balls. Go close up with this. You can do an implant with balls and O-rings or you can sit there and do uh, bars. Um, but talk it over with your lab case. Sometimes I've asked him, well, let's do a bar. And he said, Howard, we just don't have the room, man. We just don't have the room. So it depends on your inner arch clearance. It depends on uh, uh, what they look like. Uh, just, just do what you need to do. Uh, here, this is the first one I ever did. This was back in 1987. Look at that. That was, that was clear. Uh, 1987. And uh, that woman is still kicking. And uh, there's her little implant bridge. She absolutely loves it. And you can see the little skin graft on there or the... Uh, um, oral surgeon uh, put a, uh, a one inch by six inch strip of her butt right there on her lower jaw, skin graft first. And uh, she absolutely loves it. She says she could, uh, uh, she made the funniest remark, she said she'd go out there and eat her mailbox after it was done. And I said, okay, I guess you're 80 years old. That's the only thing you're thinking about is your damn mailbox. Uh, there's bone grafts. Um, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. Uh, I... I don't, I'm not sitting here thinking that, you know, you're going to go to Carl Mish, you're going to learn how to do skin grafts, bone grafts, um, you're going to be doing this, uh, stay on these deals here. Um, I'm not saying that you need to learn how to do that. I'm not saying um, you need to learn how to do all these fancy things. Uh, here's one I just did not very long ago. A uh, lady had a den like a partial. I would not do this anymore. Actually, I think, I forgot why I did that. Maybe, um, I don't know, but I don't like this because there's two implants for a three-unit bridge, if one of those implants fails, I lose the whole damn case. Um, you can have a lucky outcome without making a high quality decision. That's a tree implant I did. That is not a high quality decision. That is a lucky outcome. One of those implants goes, I lose all three teeth. You're never gonna have a three tooth cantilever off one implant. And even if you just cut off one tooth and try to have one tooth with one cantilever tooth, yeah, I'm give that implant a year and it's gone. Uh, that was a lucky outcome, not a high quality decision. One implant for every buckle root. All I'm trying to get you to do is realize the value that if you would low through the Mish Institute and you would do these things um, and go to Ken Judy, join the ICOI, get motivated. You're going to have another tool in your toolbox and it's going to be very fun and very profitable. And thank you for another very fun day. I'll see you back tomorrow. Until then, go for it. Bye-bye.